hi. Um, I didn't turn off my cell phone, <laughs> which is really interesting. I realized I just turned it on. Um, I gave a TED Talk last year at the United Nations on compassion. And it was, it was an interesting experience because it showed me the state of our world. And I, I was going to talk about that for a few minutes and then go into my talk. But I came into the UN, and I hadn't been in the UN since I was a kid. I grew up in New York, and the UN was like this amazing place. And now the UN is falling apart. They're, the paint is old, the carpets are ratty. Um, it looks like it hasn't gotten cleaned in about 20 years because the world doesn't put any money towards peace. And we have, you know, Facebook opening up with 20 gazillion dollars and the UN doesn't get a dime. And the other thing that I saw at the UN which was really remarkable is how much security there was. And, and it was a little chilling because you come into the UN where supposedly the whole world is getting together to try to make peace and you have to go through what feels like airport security before you can even enter the building and then probably about every hundred feet is a security guard and I had to wear a badge and a patch and I had no sense that peacekeeping was going on there and it, 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 was, it was an interesting thing because it's so far out of our sight that you know we as a culture we let things like the UN decay and we have gotten so whatever it is violent and scared that security felt like the most important thing at the UN and then right across the street this is the thing that was so interesting to me right across the street is a brand new Trump Tower that looked like it cost billions and it was in perfect condition just absolutely perfect condition and these, the new construction was going up and it was gorgeous. And I'm looking across the street at Trump Tower thinking, wait a second, we put billions towards Trump Tower and almost nothing towards the United Nations. And boy, what does that say about us? And so the talk that I wanted to give was, are we doing that in our own lives? Like how much are we putting in our lives to the deep values that help people get along with each other, that make the world a better place, and how much are we putting in our lives to those things that are just showy, luxurious, and pretty useless at some very basic level. You know, I teach the happiness classes at Stanford, which is an interesting thing to do because the students there are very stressed. And it is, it is a nice thing to be able to teach them things about how to relax and chill a little bit and, and whatever. But there is abundant evidence that money doesn't make you happier except when you go from no money to some. So if you're dropped off in a desert somewhere and you have nothing and you find like a thousand bucks, it's like, yes. But if you have enough to eat and things that you need, like a basic car and stuff like that, then making more money has very little additive to happiness. And so again, I'm thinking of Trump Tower and I'm thinking of the UN. And we are starving the UN and we as a culture are building all of these luxuries and we as, you as students and even me as consumers are getting lost in our need for luxuries and consumption. And does it make us happy? You know, there was a study done, oh, I don't know, 20 years ago, that looked at people who made a certain reasonably low amount of money. And it was like twenty-five or $30,000. And that they, they asked those people, like, how many of you had met your life goals? And they, maybe like five or six percent had said yes. And then they asked people making a hundred grand, which 20 years ago was a lot of money, how many of you had met your life goals? And maybe 2% more had. And it was, it was shocking information that we are taught almost from birth that money and luxury and things that you want will satisfy you. 
And the evidence continues to accumulate that that's not true. But because we're in a culture that does that, we have the UN in one part and all the other things in another part. And I believe, and this is the sadness that I see, I think we're doing that inside of ourselves as well. I think we are training ourselves out of listening to other people. I think we are losing sight of what's really important in life. And I think culturally we're all being brainwashed that consuming stuff is the purpose of life. You know, as, a, as an adult, and, and many of you are, are, are children and students, I walk into like Whole Foods and I think to myself, like in the whole history of the world, almost nobody has ever had this much luxury, ever. That I can buy anything I want, that food comes in from all over the world and it's just standing there for me. And yet I have been taught at some level to notice whether somebody's at the express lane with too many items. And I'm thinking to myself, how did we brainwash ourselves to be that crazy? So that we are impatient all the time and in a hurry all the time and not stopping to see what we have. You know, so I use Whole Foods as kind of a metaphor or whatever, Safeway, it doesn't even matter. But we have so much and we still need more. And, and I look at that and I think, okay, is that the way to create a good community? Is that the way to create a good culture? Or does that lead to the UN not having paint? Which is what I think it does. You know, one of the things that the happiness studies show is that the people who are happier, the thing that separates them mostly from other people is the quality of their relationships. That if you're going to put your effort in one direction for a good life, it's towards other people and yourself. You may have been taught all sorts of things in your home. You may have been taught all sorts of things in school about how achievement and status and being the best and on top is going to make you happy. And it's not. People, well, I mean, it's not going to make you happy to be the worst either. But people matter. One of the things that separates happier from less happy people is they know how to appreciate their friends. And they know how to pay attention to them. And they know how to honor them. Unhappier people tend to see friends as kind of accessories or commodities. You know, oh yeah, he's my buddy, but I don't have to really nourish that. And they treat themselves in some ways the same way. And I think to myself, like, why isn't that what we're being taught in school? Like, how to be nice to people. How to be nice to ourselves. Because that's the strongest link to a happy life. There are very, 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 very many happy people who don't have PhDs or master's degrees or are not doing fancy occupations. You live in Silicon Valley here and you know there are very, very many unhappy people who have every material and achievement thing nailed. Because all you have to do is watch them drive and you know they're not happy. Because an unhappy person is impatient. That's an unhappy sign, which is, wait a second, I can't wait 10 seconds for somebody to go a little slower? or not know where they're going to turn? Like, what is it that has me so crazed that I can't wait? Or that I can't relax? So it's interesting, one time I was at the Whole Foods in Los Altos here on Thanksgiving, or the day before Thanksgiving, and I was buying stuff for my Thanksgiving, as with everybody else. And you would think that the people in that store had just come out of starvation because they were so grim and tense, like get out of my way because I'm in a hurry, I have to cook Thanksgiving dinner. And there was such tense, hostile energy there as opposed to, wow, we're the wealthiest people on the history of the planet. A billion people go to bed without food at night, every night. And is all I have to do is wait a little bit at this temple of abundance 
And I can't even do that with graciousness. And I think, wow, what a world. So the things that lead to happiness, people, purpose is the other one. Like, is what you're doing valuable? And will it help people? Will it help the world? The UN will help the world. Trump Tower will probably not. But we put better resources to Trump Tower than we do to the UN. I think we do the same with all of our professions, but that's too big of a, of a brush. So the teachers teaching here make barely livable wages. And yet all over Silicon Valley are people making products that will have limited value, making huge wages. But within our own lives, we can ask ourselves, what are we supposed to do here? For students, that's particularly relevant. What can you do that will help the world? What can you do that will make a difference? When in your mind you think, who can I help? Like, what talents do I have? Not just, what's the best for me to get ahead? Not just, how can I make the most money? How can I have the most status? How can I be the top of a pyramid? All that's fine, but it won't make you happy. It won't make you unhappy, per se, but it won't make you happy. What makes happy is people who get up in the morning and have a good purpose to their day. You know, my work is going to help people, or I'm making it easier for somebody, or I'm going to build the best of something. It matters. And again, it directly leads to happiness. People who have some sense that there's something bigger than themselves. You know, there's a lot of data that shows that people who try to make a lot of money to make a lot of money, what's so interesting about that is they make the money and then they need more. People who try to do good or make a difference and make money, they appreciate the money. The third thing, and the simplest thing to lead to a happier life, is at some level just be a nice human being. The simplest exhortation of all. Just be pleasant. When the Dalai Lama was asked, like, what's his religion? He said, my religion is kindness. Basically because that's all he said that he can understand. You know, I don't know the big picture. You know, I don't know how it is the world's supposed to be, but I know that I can be kinder. When you are kinder, and this is broadly applied, when people are nice to you, you say thank you. When people have been nice to you, you let them off the hook when they make a mistake. When people have been kind to you, you cut them slack. When, say, somebody is wrong, you don't rip them apart to make yourself right if they have been nice to you. That's kindness. Kindness is when you screw up, you know how to talk to yourself so you learn from the lesson, not just beat yourself up. Kindness is huge, but it includes gratitude, because you can't be kind unless you notice what's been given to you which is one of the things that people don't think about when they think about kindness. Gratitude is a huge part of kindness. Who's been nice? Who's reached out to me? How can I pay that back? You know, again, I, you, know, you don't want to belabor the point, but many of us are unable to see who it is that's been good to us because we pay so much attention to who hasn't been good to us. The opposite is the way to happiness. Who's been good to you? One of the things that you can do to make yourself happier almost immediately is just think, today, did anybody say a nice word to me? Did anybody listen to me? Did anybody offer me anything? If so, it's been in part a good day. Let me pay that forward. Let me pay that back or let me use it 
so that when somebody's not nice or somebody cuts me off on the freeway or somebody's impatient with me, I give them a break. And so the bottom line of all of this, and it's very interesting, is do we want to build like temples to our like greed? Or do we want to build temples to trying to get along, trying to work things out, and trying to accommodate people's differences? That's the UN versus Trump Tower. But I think the question is more relevant for our own lives. So when you come home, or when I come home, like how agreeable are you? You know, do you come in as if the world owes you everything? Or do you come in like, you know, mellow, chill, let's work something out? That's, that's a decision that any of us can make. The minute you make that decision, you're happier. So I'm gonna ask you in the audience, as I talk, just to practice this for a moment, just think, of one person that you could be nicer towards. Just think about that for a moment. What would be one person that you could in your mind envision being nicer towards today because they've been particularly kind or nice to you? Just one human being. And as you think of that, you will notice that your body relaxes and more positive emotion comes in because you're thinking about what good you can do. When you're thinking about what's owed you, or when you're thinking about how much more you need to grab for yourself, you don't have the same physical reaction. Your body gets tight because the world or that person or everything is a threat to your well-being. But when you think of, wow, who's been good? And how can I use that to be good myself? Then there's almost no threat. And your body relaxes. At the end of the day, those kind of decisions are what lead us to our happiness. It's those kind of decisions. Do I be nice? Do I be generous? Can I give somebody a break? Rather than just a daily kind of obsession with how much is on my plate. Am I getting ahead? And now the last thing I will say about this is there is absolutely nothing wrong with success. I've been as successful as anyone. The question is, and, and this is the, the UN Trump Tower thing, is how do you evaluate your own success? The happier people tend to do so by having a bigger us and not just them. I thank you.